Yeah. How much time has it? One hour. Okay. I have some eighty slides, but I'll run through them. And uh, I really want to thank the college because it is a premier institution of higher learning in the state, and they have a great vision. I see. NAC accreditation college with the A grade and the IFS certificate. Many things I read in the Google. I'm very happy to be here this morning. And the title of the seminar, as uh, Ashish said, it is the fascinating world of uh, truly fascinating. You will see this. And uh, very happy to be here. The title of my talk, I said, The Fungal World as We Know. I wish to address this under four subheadings. First few slides, I will explain to you what are fungi. You know that what fungi are. Then uh, how the fungi have been perceived over the years. I want to give you a history of uh, the understanding. All of us are learning, learners. Although we teach, we learn and teach. So how people perceived these fungi over the years. I will trace the history of that. Then how the fungi are recognized? Again, the taxonomy part. That's what we are working a great deal. And uh, how we did some work, all of us, me and my students. So that's what we want to do. And you know these definitions. I'm sure that from the high school to college, we learn about fungi because this is one of the important components of the living world, fungi and a major functional group in every ecosystem. Everything that we draw, throw out has to be degraded and along with bacteria, fungi are an important community to degrade these organic substances. They find you will see the fungi everywhere, all kinds of habitats. And they it, it's not that they just live there, but they interact with the plants, animals, and the humans as various ways, which we'll see. And about uh, uh, 1 lakh 20,000 species have been so far described of the estimated 2.5 to 3.8 million. And uh, something like 30,000 species approximately are known from India. And uh, fungi are very special organisms. If you ask me why fungi are taught along with botany, it's primarily because many of the fungi are pathogenic um, plants. Many of the, many of the crop diseases are due to fungi. That's why they have been teaching along with botany. In nature, fungi are a separate kingdom of their own. Uh, they are, you will see from unicellular to filamentous, the mycelium form, most diverse organisms compared to any other one. They are heterotrophic, although we keep in the plant kingdom, they are achlorophyllous. And uh, that's why they are neither plants nor animals. Their cell wall, unlike plants, their cell wall contains chitin, and they subsist primarily by absorptive mode of nutrition. I mean, they secrete their enzymes outside, digest the organic material, then they absorb them. And they reproduce by both sexual and asexual forms and by tiny spores. It's all known to us. Ecologically, they even outstrip their ability to degrade the organic, organic matter. They outstrip even bacteria. Um, you will see them everywhere, terrestrial, aquatic, endophytic, and so on. Of the two major groups, of living organisms, plants and fungi, if you compare them, this is the kind of numbers we see. In other words, in the plant kingdom, we know quite a lot. Whereas fungi, we know only 5 to 7 percent of them. And uh, within the fungal kingdom, um, there's a big number, and world tax, I've given a list here. If you see, only the 
world fungi and indian fungi we know very little about them and this are these numbers are he keep on changing because as and we describe a newer fungi the number will increase and this is the traditional classification which we see in our textbooks in the classroom textbooks uh, webster's classification if you see 1983 plant kingdom is divided into um, Fungi are classified as a subkingdom in the plants. And then Bixomycota, it's slime molds, and the Eumycota, true fungi. Slime molds are already removed out of the fungal kingdom. And uh, within the Eumycota, again, there are fungi which part the lower fungi, some of them have moved out. I'll show you the next slide. And uh, if you see the modern classification, Oomycetes and slime molds are already out. And uh, the true fungi are only the chytrids, zygote forming fungi, then vascular, arbuscular, mycorrhizal fungi, then uh, ascomycetes and basidomycetes. These are only the one in the present system. They are said to be the true fungi. Oh, that's the classification. And uh, that is the first one. What fungi are? Now, the second part, which I said, how fungi have been looked over the period of time. Historically, if you see, fungi did not merit well in the beginning. The perception was that fungi are not good organisms. They are really bad organisms because they cause major plant diseases like rust, smuts, mildews, blights, and so on. All plant major crop diseases. Then fungi also spoil the food in storage, food deterioration, mushroom poisoning, all this, everything they do, destructive activities. They inflict some serious human and animal diseases called as mycosis. So in 1883, Cook and Berkeley, two uh, famous mycologists of those days, they wrote, except those which are employed for human food like mushrooms and yeast very few fungi of any practical value this was the statement made in about uh, 150 years ago then why they did this if you see from the historical times irish potato famine then delphi 30s that's a paxinia graminis on wheat in the american continent during 1930s, 10 years period, they it was so destructive on wheat. So they called those that particular decade as dirty 30s. And the Wolo famine in Ethiopia in 1983, there was a famine due to Clavisus purpurea on Aragrostis stuff. Their uh, principal crop it was. Then the Great Bengal famine is in India. Elminthos gore marice on rice, then mildews on grapes, or uh, downy mildews on grapes. All these were said to be most destructive diseases those days. So uh, this is why uh, this was the reason why fungi were considered to be very bad organisms. And not only that, fungi inflict major crop diseases and curtail agricultural productivity. If you see lots of them are fungal diseases in the plant system. And besides, even post-harvest, like fungi deteriorate fruits and vegetables, they spoil bread. If you keep the bread for a couple of days, you will see bread mold, fruit rot, moldy cheese. There are so many types of that. That is on the plant system. Even the human system, if you see, some of the fungi cause dreadful diseases, uh, superficial, subcutaneous and systemic mycosis all due to fungal system then there are wild mushrooms uh, uh, which are some of them are like ammonite muscaria deadly poisonous said to be very fatal then some of these fungi uh, like aflatoxin producing ones cause powerful toxins so for all these reasons fungi were said to be very bad organisms but 
the perception changed over the period of time. Uh, in 1992, in a major seminal paper, Professor C. V. Subramanian wrote recent examples of harnessing fungal power for human needs highlight the massive potential and future bright poss possibilities for us. So he gave a picture that it's not really bad organisms, they are good organisms. And Price Kendrick, same time, uh, another world famous mycologist, he said there is a paradigm shift in our understanding of fungi that they are not bad organisms, but good organisms. So what is good? What are good about fungi? So the, I have listed here for you. Best degraders of organic material. They degrade even plastic. They degrade hydrocarbons. So extreme, most difficult substances they can degrade. Good food. And they produce life-saving drugs, biofertilizers, biocontrol agents, nanobiotechnology. They even you can synthesize gold using fungi, biofuels, alcohol, then cellular lasers, there are many uh, activities, fungi, which can be harnessed for some advantage. So the useful fungi offer useful producers, products, and wonderful opportunities. These are the opportunities which we can take for our advantage. Let's see, few of them. Are. So I have put it in a nutshell here how fungi are involved in most of human endeavors. Uh, except those which I have written in red ink, I think those two, all the rest are the good activities of fungi. We have bread because of fungi. You know how bread is made, yeast, then variety, all the alcoholic beverages are due to fungi, mushroom delicacy, then uh, they are best degraders and most important amongst this is the fungi in uh, production of medicines and healthcare. That's a few examples. Okay, this is some approximately in 2014, some statistics available on healthcare, foodstuffs and beverages, agriculture, waste utilization, industrial enzymes, bioremediation biocontrol, decorative uses. There are many places where worldwide commercial uses of fungi, uh, some that's available. I will give you just highlight major issues of healthcare. There are major milestones. If you see the history, um, discovery of penicillins, ergotin, cephalosporins, cyclosporins, tax on statins, everything are fungal products. Major drugs which are produced by a variety of fungi. I've given a few examples just to see this. Then uh, fungal secondary metabolites um, are compounds produced by an organism which is not really essential for its uh, growth, but they are um, lots of applications of these secondary metabolites. Six out of 20 most commonly prescribed human medicines are from fungi. Most famous, of course, is penicillin. We know that Alexander Fleming, who got the Nobel Prize. I give a few um, examples of fungal use. Ganoderma, which if you go to the forest here in the Western Ghats, you will see this, one of the most prominent uh, bracket mushrooms, a uh, bracket fungi one of those, and uh, Ganoderma, it has a multi-utility medicinal fungus. And if you, I'm told that in Chinese medicines is known from since Ming dynasty, 14th century, said to be most widely used and a kind of a wide, broad spectrum um, applications it has. Interestingly, all species of Ganoderma, without exception, you can cultivate them today. There are many uh, industries which are doing this exercise because they have got utility of them, which we don't do in India much. 
and uh, second one cordyceps is a caterpillar fungus which is also very unique fungus it grows on uh, insects and said to be most useful uh, in uh, medical industry you know? uh, someone is growing in goa to this one uh, generally it is growing in the hilly grasslands mostly the tibetan region uh, and himalayan mountains and it's a big trade in uh, tibet and the chinese regions there and this is kind of examples we have um, but if you see the biology of this fungus uh, fungus infects a live caterpillar i've written in the base here it forces the caterpillar to burrow the soil and then this insect gets killed and the fungus grows its stroma at the tip here let's see okay here and if you cut open that you will see the entire fungal structure ascocar then as a ascospores it's very interesting fungus and the medicinal properties on this part of the game and there are uh, i have shown a picture here of a medical shop exclusively the fungal products in china uh, that's a kind of a utility of this fungus i don't put any picture because this fungus has no fruit bodies to show you it's an endophyte growing in cinnamon muscadel humbus this fungus is an endophyte and it doesn't produce a fruit body and doesn't sporulate only mycelium form and what is the power of mycelium we will have the next lecture by dr kumar he will speak us and interestingly this fungus produces a number of volatile organic compounds said to be of medical use this one that is in the medical industry how powerful fungal products are and even in agriculture there are myco pesticides used in biocontrol especially fungi like uh, trichoderma metarhizium and so on which has application especially for controlling the um, it's used as an insecticide they are used apart from the its application as a spray bio spray they are also used in bio fertilizers we know this va mycorrhizal fungus then fungal application in biodegradation biodemerization said to be the one of the most powerful areas big role in the maintenance of natural environment <coughs> I have put this to show you how fungi live otherwise. Saprobic fungi aid in decomposition. Here's an interesting phenomenon if you see leaf cutting ants here at the base, and they carry these leaves to the termite mount, store there, and uh, <coughs> seed them with the fungal mycelium and uh, that is how they supplement their cellulase. They don't have cellulase to degrade these leaves. So ants carry them to this mount, maintain them in cold chambers there, air-conditioned chambers, that temperature maintained structure, where the these leaf bits are decomposed by fungal mycelium. Then those decomposed material the ants eat and that also produces the termitomyces which is very common in our forests here very important uh, symbiotic association with uh, fungi also very important in foods mushrooms well known to us there are uh, major industry in goa by dr kurades butter mushroom Cultivated edible mushrooms are uh, most important as a 
protein supplement for us. And I have given some bit of statistics here. The, but it's all from different sources I collected. Button mushroom, oyster mushroom, then chicken mushroom, whatever this, the names we have. But the, they're all very good protein supplements for us. And it's well standardized now, button mushroom cultivation. And uh, I have given this picture to show you. One of my students, a Chinese student, worked in uh, Mayfield Wang University in Thailand. Uh, I only have his uh, pet name. Popo is name. Don't know his full name now. But he went back to his country, then started a mushroom industry. This is his work. And he also have an ex he fed with an exclusive mushroom meal that day. And uh, he cultivates many of these, including Ganoderma, you see here. Big industry he has. And most uh, important mushroom which he sells is auricularia, interestingly. That's one. There are uh, fungi as food proteins, mycoprotein uh, supplements. No, no, we have soft drinks, myco sauces, alcoholic beer, everything. So, what I said in the beginning, people said, oh, fungi are very bad organisms. That's not true. They are really very good organisms. Yeah. And uh, I have put this slide, this from uh, Dr. Keith Schiffer's slide I took. Who is a pe peculiar name, P, is a fungal fermented product, said to be the most lovely tea in the world today. And this is with a fungus called Aspergillus acidus. Aspergillus acidus is actually a pathogenic fungus in human pathogen. But interestingly, when it is fermenting this tea, said to be produces one of the most beautiful teas. Fungi are robust organisms because of their mycelia, which we will learn in the next lecture. More about it. Fungal mycelia are the most versatile. They can grow so fast and uh, so thick and produce their enzymes. And they can invade most difficult hardwoods, fungal mycelium. Oh. They can be grown very easily. Fungi can be grown uh, in any in nutrient media and utilized for all kinds of applications. Uh, you can produce fer fungal fermenters, which I have told that available in thousands of liters now, where you can get huge biomass and a huge amount of secondary metabolites. Everything can be done in a short span of two to three weeks now. So fungi offer wonderful opportunities. Fungal biotechnology has great potential. People like us, fungal taxonomists, you know, we can do very little, of course, that we can collect fungi from different places, identify them, culture them. This is what we do and uh, put them in repositories, culture collections. And when these culture collections have a large collection, that is the source for fungal chemists and biologists, where they can use them for fungal biotechnology. This is the summation of how this interaction takes place. That is, we can isolate the fungus in culture, study them, maintain in repositories. There are um, Two now well known, well recognized, and most powerful two repositories in the country. One is in Pune Agarka Research Institute, the National Fungal Culture Collection and Microbial Type Culture Collection uh, in Chandigarh. These are the two ones, and they have got a great role to do. Not only they are safe deposit of fungal cultures, 
Then they also do taxonomic identifications. There are excellent taxonomists there in Pune and uh, Chandigarh now. Interestingly, all of them are known to us and our students also some of them. And they also do timely supply of these pure strains to industries. Okay, that's the second. Uh, I have quickly run through these two the parts. How fungi are recognized? I spoke about this a few days ago, uh, courtesy Dr. Dhamas in a talk, but I just put those slides here to tell you. Um, freeze is like Linnaeus in plant kingdom, said to be the father of my culture. So the starting point for fungal classification and identification is Elias Freese, a uh, Swedish botanist. And uh, remember those days, they had very crude microscopes. Today we have most sophisticated ones. So someone sees them using a small, like a hand lens, something remarkable it is. So Freese divided the fungi into four classes in those days. You can read this, I'm sure it will be available later on for you. How they distinguish the fungi primarily by seeing how they look like. So their morphology, color, and structure, basically. That's what they took the so that's how they named them. For example, freeze divided the fungi into four classes: coniomycetes, hyphomycetes, gastromycetes, hyalomycetes. So all those conidia, small conidia, the name was given because conis means dust, dust particles. So that's how they call them conidia. And all those who produce the dust particle like spores, they group them in coniomycetes. And uh, those which are producing filaments with some structures, fruiting bodies, they kept in 1821, in hyphomycetes. Gastromycetes with kind of a silo. They have got some kind of cavity inside. So, enclosed to hymenia, uh, like puffball, you know, that's one. They could open the gastromycetes. Hymenomycetes with a cap with an opening, exposed to hymenia. So, very crude classification, but they made an effort. That's what we should admire. We can't say, oh, they did not did well because those days, uh, as as she said, we walked those days barefoot you know, when we were young. But you should admire that kind of you know understanding they had those days. Later, with the microscopic evidences, they modified these classifications. And I put few names which I believe they are their contributions are most important, like. ACJ Corda, Tulane Brothers, CR Tulane and LR Tulane. My professor used to tell those days that their contributions are much more than us, ours, because those days the facilities were very meager and the stress was more than, but simply because of their passion for this study, which the last slide I have put again this one. Um, Corridor's name I value very much because he was the first one to use microscope to study the fungi. And he named that fungus, last one you see, the Stachybotrys cartero, a fungus which appears on paper. If you keep a book without reading for two months, you will see a fungus in the bind. That is Stachybotrys cartero. He named those days that fungus tachybotrys. Even today, it is valid. That means his identification characterization was most perfect. And Tulane brothers, two brothers, did most some lovely illustrations of the complete fungus, a holomorph, a sexual and asexual states, said to be most important contribution those days. Then. The development of mycology taxonomy, we I like to group them into three eras. 
Sakaldo Nera, Hubesia Nera, and Border Nera. Sakaldo times are that time, but people did a great deal of contribution in those days, like Clements and Share, Sakaldo. Look at this Sakaldo's contribution. He wrote all what he did was he compiled all the knowledge available until then and put them together in 24 volumes. And all the fungi which were described in different languages, he Latinized with it. Single language. He wrote 22 volumes. The last two volumes were written by his son, a doctor, a medical doctor. He compiled them as a tribute to his father. So since frees up to Sakarada, most uh, wonderful contributions. Clements and Share, that book was available for us for reference, genera of fungi, until then. So those are the, that's the time, the earliest period we call them as Sakarada Then 1952, Hugh Senera, I think I have a few couple of slides here. And he, Hughes, what he did was, what we see is not enough, but the development of the fungus also should be a criteria. And modern era is the molecular data available. That's David Hilbert's time. So I have a few slides I have. Sakarado era, I said, color and type of fruit body. These are the two important criteria. And those days he published a one party paper. Not a small effort it was. It's a big contribution. He classified them and he called his classification as chromotaxia because it was primarily based on color those days. And it's, set, it's, set, it's a, truly it's an artificial system, but first pragmatic effort. That's why we respect that contribution in a big way. Then, okay, that's the classification of the and based on that. Einsworth and Bisbee's classification. 1971 it was, and it is, even now in the textbooks you will see this classification. Then over the period of time, fungal taxonomic studies evolved. So microscope was the major tool used. Um, the thinking is that we should see the my fungus how it is growing. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That development reflects the phylogeny. That is what they try to do. And some interesting tools were available. If today we don't see them, Riddle slide culture technique, which we use in a big way to see how the fungus is growing. Then, Pugsianera. First was Sakardo time, then Pugsianera. 1950s morphology and development. These are the two important criteria. Stan Hughes, he uh, died just uh, two years, one and a half years back, at the age of 101. Yeah, and, uh, I, I met him once. Big man he was in the uh, His contribution is primarily how the fungus is growing. That should be the criteria. That's what he said. And it, is, it was applicable primarily for conidial fungi, but he used it for the sexual morph also. And Professor C. V. Uh, we are very proud, both of us, myself and Dr. Omar, because it's one of the giants of mycology in those days. And this is a uh, major issue which uh, Hughes proposed that. Uh, a sexually reproducing fungi produce their conidia in different patterns. Six to seven kinds of conidium developments were recognized. And they called them in different names like arthric, blasting, phyllidic, and so on. I'll not go to details of them, but these were useful to us for classifying the fungi. And 1950s to 1990s, numerous fungi were there. That was said to be the golden period in describing the fungi. 
Uh, many labs, even in India, did lots of work out there. And outstanding contributions from world over, you will see names like Yami Ellis, Professor C. V. Subramanian, Tobaki from Japan, Ellis is from England, then Matsushima from Japan again, Carmichael and Kendrick from Canada, Minter, David Minter from uh, Q, again from England. They contributed in a big way for the understanding of fungal diversity. I kept this name Bryce Kendrick separate. If you go to Google and write mycolog.com, you will get his book, Fifth Kingdom. You must see this book because it, you can freely download this book because he says it's not any copyright because I want more people to read. Right? Just like what Dr. Damodar says, uh, more people we tell this information so the knowledge goes around in a big way. Bryce Kendrick is also one of the top class mycologists because he's the one tried in 1980s unify the asexual and sexual factor. That I have put one paper here, one of his subdivision neutromycotina is a fungal chimera. So and he also conducted two important international conferences called first Kananaskis conference and second Kananaskis after a decade gap he gave. And first one he spoke about the conidial fungi, and second one he spoke about the whole fungus, both sexual and asexual. We should not see them separate. We should try to put them. But the difficulty those days, at time of Kendrick's time, was that how to link them. That so that that linking exercise came up after 1996. Uh, okay, this uh, I'll skip this slide. Modern era. Revolution in fungal taxonomy uh, commenced in the 1990s, and the major contribution led by a team, David Hibbert, and he started in 1996, to be precise, and in 2007, he published a paper, a higher level phylogenetic classification of fungi, and this was primarily based on the uh, molecular sequence studies of numerous labs participated. Some 52 authors participated in publishing this paper uh, in mycological research. And this paper offered an overall understanding of fungi at the molecular level and provided a roadmap for future fungal systematics. That is the contribution. So since then, the top or fourth was, or the idea is that we should review the fungi based on, and we should have one name for one fungus. Okay, that's a bit of, this is the present system which I gave a little earlier. And uh, if you see here two classifications, Imesworth and Bisbee's classification is a traditional polyphyletic, and modern classification is monophyletic. So this is what is the requirement in future, and this is possible only, only if you supplement your morphology with phylogenetic studies based on molecular sequence data. Okay. So this is a uh, how much time I have? Uh, Ten minutes. Okay. So how? So I gave you something about what people did around. Now bit of work what we did together. Uh, I started my work in 1975. I said this a few days ago in another talk. My professor, what he did was, when I joined for my PhD, he gave me two cultures, two tubes he gave me, test tubes with the fungal culture. Both of them were named. One was Fusarium decimicellular, another one my monographical and various. He said, Jaram, you will study this fungus in next two months. 
the entire biology of these two fungi. Give me the picture. I will come back to you after two months. He was not like the guides, like every day you have to go and report. Not like that. After two months, I met him. So I had, fortunately, some good support from my seniors, like them in the lab, in the Madras University Laboratory, whom I could approach. So starting from culture, media preparation, slide preparation, how to examine the cameras in a drive, everything I learned in two months' time, record time. So I knew not only these two fungi, any fungus. I would go out, see them, and put them. That was the beauty of teaching those days. It's not only that, we were so focused, we could study. So two months later, when I said, yes, you will now start your work. You, you can join my group. That's the kind of certification came by uh, that. We don't see such guides. Neither we will have such students these days. I mean, not students will be there, but they will not accept such guides. Okay. Okay. Uh, because they will question them or they will go back and tell to their friends, oh, I have a tough guide. So you know, so many things are there. We have seen this now. So I put this slide to tell you that how the uh, you know how we initiate our work. And remember, my these professors were they're beyond their level of abilities, you know, such strong mind. And I'm just admiring to see. My professor, how big he was those days. Okay. Uh, fungi mostly live in association with the plants. And you will see them all this kind of that is they are in this soil as rhizosphere fungi, little fungi on forest floor, philoplan fungi on the tree, plant pathogens, like and sendophytes. And even coprophilus fungi, you can see them. I think maybe Pratibha's slide I have taken here. Uh, that slide which I showed you here, all these pictures. Then uh, we worked mostly, our major focus was on Western Ghats region. Uh, we collected samples from there with the numerous field trips. Then our Everywhere we went, from starting from coastal to the hill regions. And with several students, we worked over more than four decades. We searched everything for fungi. Our focus was on fungi. We brought them to the lab, cultured them, didn't leave anything just on them. Then we described the new and interesting fungi. All the cultures, we try to deposit them in the national repository, maintain some in the regional repository also. That's what it And we also described them. We collected fungal samples from everywhere. I've given a few pictures here to tell you. We went to forests. Then suppose we see some samples we wanted. We had no hesitation to dump into a pond. That is with the Dr. Tapan Chakravarti, I collected samples from a pond. Uh, Tapan Chakravarti from Gimtech. Then, uh, we, if required, we would carry, we used to carry the microscope to the field, see the fungus in the evenings. And this is a method, very simple methods we used. Uh, brought the samples, incubated them. As when the fungi grew. Oh, I have a picture of Pratibha here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Looking at the fungi. And uh, all the cultures, what they did were pure cultures, and we tried to identify them and we, we studied. Typically, like this, 
we everything we try to bring them into culture and we also study their developmental morphology and after you know i didn't do this but they continued this exercise all my students they did molecular analysis subsequently that's the method they use and they describe for me and uh, this is a typical ascomycete we truly we concentrated on microfungi we didn't touch any of the uh, big mushrooms because we didn't know how to we could do everything together and ascomycete has got two phases in their life cycle asexual and sexual these two phases mostly appeared separately very rarely you would see this together so that's why dual taxonomy came from sakardos time that is separate name for asexual phase aspergillus and eurotium to the sexual phase otherwise both these are same for us but rarely they would produce at one place both phases from a taxonomist point it is not good same for us two names but this problem continued because we had no tools no method to study them fortunately we have them through the molecular sequencing data and okay these are the three um, diagnostic you can see them later and one of the major reference materials those days was dictionary of fungi i respect and value this very much because this was like a bible for us and 1971 7th edition 2008 we have the 10th edition everything known on fungi are put in this um uh, volume big huge volume uh, all generic names of fungi their families orders everything was available in this book this day of fungi and the fungi the advanced studies um fourth edition no no fourth volume This was another reference book we had those days. And uh, 2011, we had this voluminous book, "Genera of Phytomyces" by Keith Shepherd. He came here in 2015, the international conference. It's a monumental effort which he did, and uh, fortunately he gave few copies with uh, uh, Dr. Damodar. He did his postdoctoral with Keith Shepherd. and many of us have copies of this so how should we look at the fungi uh, in future this is a, if any one of you want to pick up the fungal studies in future collect the samples anywhere you can go to a stream you can go to the forest or you can go to marine environment anywhere you collect them samples samples i mean where a fungi are growing it could be plant litter leaf litter or it may be a herbivore dung anything you bring them to the lab first examine under the microscope try to identify or recognize the fungus then establish the pure culture i stress this because you don't know whether you will be able to go to the same place and collect a sample so when you bring the sample this is what is required you should culture them and uh, look at them under the microscope if it's four leaves then analyze the molecular sequence data because that is how you will identify them uh, qualify that fungus later on write your observations more meticulously today you have a laptop those days we used to jot down in notebooks my professors used to ask them she was your notes got your written with the dates so that you should interact with the collaborators don't work yourself in a corner because alone we can do very little but in a group with interaction you can do a great deal more the merrier then publish your data all your observations in good journals i say this primarily to teachers also because if you don't publish 
you will not be known. It's not for uh, if you publish your data, you get confidence. Oh, maybe if it is not a published material, it will come back to you. Reviewers will not accept it. But if you don't make efforts, you will not. Normally in the colleges, it's not a criticism, but it is a kind of an observation that one or two papers we publish because that is required for promotions. That's not enough. You must publish so that we are known around. Publication is one of the important criteria for a researcher. There are uh, several labs working. You, should, you can interact with them and ask them for help. We, these are a few new fungi which we described over the years. Few of them. Then uh, I have few examples, and most of these examples are from my students. Uh, this is the first fungus that I described in 1977. Bahu Sutra Bija in 1977. We published in the Canadian, Canadian Journal of Botany in uh, those days. And today, this fungus, genus has five species, means it's a very strong fungus, very strong genus. And uh, the sequence data of this fungus is done by. Dr. Damodar, much later. Uh, the, the few slides here from Pratibha and Puja, no, no, Pratibha and uh, Ashish, I have put here. Um, a few of those publications. This is Ashish and Pratibha, 2017. Look at this fungus. In its uh, morphology, it's very simple. Looks like acrimony. Last picture. A small conidiophore at the tip, a conidium. Uh, you can, anyone will, by looking at the microscope, will get confused. But when the molecular analysis is done, it came to, they found out it belongs to a rodontium, another genus. So these kind of studies are very important to confirm the identity. Here is another, their own work. Pithomyces flavors. The no one knew the sexual morph of this. They were just postulating this may be the one. So traditionally, I think it was put in the leptospirulina. That's where they kept. So they confirmed its uh, sexual morph in astrospirulina based on molecular studies. This genus was described in 1956 by Professor Subramanian. 2014, uh, again, these two people brought this fungus into culture after several years. So once they have the fungus in culture, they could do the phylogenetic studies. So that, that is the purpose of culture, culturing the fungus. And uh, here is a fungus which we described uh, Pooja, who is working in Carmel College, yes, and uh, Vamsa Priya, a fungus. Vamsa Priya, Vamsa refers to bamboo. So it's isolated from bamboo. 2007, we isolated the asexual bomb and studied that fungus. And 2016, another student of us, CC Harvey, she brought studied the sexual morph separately, but we could put them together single way later. So many such fungi have been described over the period of time. It's so all their work and culturing and phylogeny studies, it's also duplicating the scientific names. That is the purpose of this, this kind of work. And we have a number of these like Torula, Goanemsis, Again, a new fungus from Goa. And uh, these are some of the you know lovely fungi which I see. Natralgenia indica. We named after a professor, a giant in mycology uh, from Madras University, Professor Natrajan. And this fungus is very interesting because it has got a it's a phyletic one. It has got a collar which is very long. And very curious fungus. 
which we know it's full morphology and uh, phylogeny today. Rattania, Cetulifera, again described by Ashish. And uh, this fungus grows on cane, isolated from here. And this is probably my last slide. Fusicola, Humsiae, IB. Recently, we wrote this paper, 2020. Um, again, Dr. Singh from Pune. Together, we wrote this fungus. He said, as a tribute to Dr. Hughes for his huge contribution to taxonomy of fungi, Stan Hughes, the fungus we dedicated him. Fungal biodiversity studies over the period we uh, we did lots of work. It's a continuous work, diversity studies, not okay, we have finished this. No more fungi we will describe because everything is over. No. We know only five to seven percent of them. So number of students can work in future. And this is my last line. I will take one minute extra here. I advise all the young students and scholars interested in fungi to cultivate not only fungi, but these points. You should have a profound interest in the subject and passion. Work. I think that is what is a driving force. For, should have an innate passion and uh, dedicated work culture and focused enthusiasm. Then only we will be successful. Uh, nothing else will help you. Um, as a student, and as a every one of us are students, including me. And all of us, unless we have that picture in the mind, we will not learn. So that's my advice for all these young people here that develop interest in the subject and uh, have a passion and focused work. Science de demands these things, studies. Microscope based morphology holds good in families. But when it is supplemented by molecular studies and uh, phylogenetic analysis, we will have the complete taxonomy of fungi. I look forward to some of you to take up this. And uh, I really credit to this. Uh, you know, most of these pictures I have taken from elsewhere. I have put here two small pictures. Uh, I teach in one high school. Sometimes I go and teach called Vishnu Gupta Vishwavidya Pitam in near Gokarna. Uh, it's a very interesting high school where they teach even Sanskrit. Primarily, that's their focus. But they also teach modern biology, science. It's a high school. So once in a while, I go and spend my time there just to enjoy the company of those kids there. Then uh, I also want to thank uh, this institute, which is now funding me, King South University of Riyadh. They have given me that fellowship. And I want to thank all of you here, especially the MP College uh, management for this opportunity and my friends here. Thank you very much.